Thank you so much. Uh, look at this incredible crowd. Um, thank you, John, for the warm welcome and the Daily Maverick for inviting me to share my um, own perspectives about the question of solutions in South Africa. I'm going to start by reminding us all that democratic South Africa is going to be 30 years old in 2024. 30. And we're often so preoccupied with our own kind of brand newness as a country and as a democracy that we forget actually we're a fully fledged democracy, fully fledged democracy. We've had seven national elections, or we will have by 2024. We've left the realm of the democratic newcomer. And now we've got to adapt and strengthen our system so that we can empower the people of our country to elect trustworthy, accountable, and effective political leaders, and to likewise fire them if and when they fail to deliver. So this year we've been really seized with the really important question of how we're going to amend our electoral laws in order to deliver on the individual right to stand for elected office and be elected to parliament and the provincial legislatures without being tied to any political party. This is a vindication of our constitutional rights to which we owe the extraordinary work and the thankless work of the New Nation movement who took the matter to the Constitutional Court in the first place, an organization hell-bent on solutions. Sadly, we've also watched Parliament scupper the opportunity to reform our democratic order into one that embraces both representation and accountability by enabling voters to elect people rather than lists of people who've been selected and prioritized under the most obscure circumstances by political parties. So, as necessary as the electoral reform process is, it would be a mistake to imagine that electoral reform or even political reform, where we would, for example, elect the president directly as voters, is some kind of silver bullet that's going to fix what ails us. We're very good as South Africans at analyzing what ails our country, and we don't often discuss what we're going to do to transform it. That's what makes today so innovative, so exciting, and so special. But we also have a habit of placing outside, outsized expectations on individuals and individual institutions to solve these systemic problems for us. It's a little bit like the over-reliance on one limb when the other limb is broken. We're especially prone to this when a leader of even a little bit of competence takes the helm of literally any government institution. The excellent Deputy uh, National Public Prosecutor, Anton Duplessis, I would argue is here today largely because, apart from being excellent, our country is completely and unrealistically preoccupied with the notion that the NPA can save our country by putting politicians in orange overalls because the NPA finally has credible leadership. But our nation has a system of interconnected, independent institutions, all of which must be strong in order to deliver on the mandate of an effective criminal justice system. Those orange overalls are issued by the National Commissioner of Correctional Services, following arrests whose purview is the police commissioners and convictions delivered by the judicial branch of government. In fact, as recently as six years ago, when the Office of the Public Protector was occupied by Prof. Tulima Donzella, a person of intellect, of courage and integrity, we imbued this public ombudsman's office with the powers to make legally binding recommendations that were never really envisaged in Chapter 9 of the Constitution. We did this in order to solve a more immediate problem. We had a rogue president on our hands who was out of control and refused to take responsibility for the Ngandla scandal. But then later, when the office of the public protector was occupied by a person of questionable integrity, these outsized powers started to seem excessive, even dangerous, and ripe for misuse for political purposes. In December of 2017, at the moment, the presiding officer at the ANC's national conference announced that President Ramaphosa had won the party's presidential election, I remember popping an actual bottle of champagne, which I pulled out of the fridge. I was relieved that we had dodged a catastrophe in the form of the so-called RET faction of the party assuming government two years later. But over the intervening five years, President Ramaphosa has been weighed down by a nation's misplaced expectations, as if like by an albatross around his neck. 
the expectation that he alone can reform a political party in decline and the government that that political party is simultaneously destroying through corruption, state capture and infighting was frankly always absurd. Yet we clung to it for dear life and we remain unable to get over our rank disappointment at one man's inability to be our national democratic messiah. I won't lie to you, I'm not going to have a single good night's sleep until and unless the next ANC conference at Nazareth delivers a similar result. The alternative would be a far greater disaster for our prospects of rebuilding this country. But it's also time for us to act grown now. We're 30 years old. A fully realized democracy and more capable of exiting that ANC death spiral which has long had our government in its grip than ever before. So, to start the proverbial fire for this next conversation, I want to suggest that we have a twofold problem to address as we embark on sharpening and redesigning our democracy to make it fit for purpose and future-proof. And here I'm going to focus on the representative and the participatory balance which defines our electoral system. The first problem is that we suffer from a system which basically renders us powerless. The second problem is that we are in a grip of, of a false sense of powerlessness about what we can do to change that. We're powerless in that we have an indirect electoral system in which the people have no real authority which, uh, and which has no legitimate or enforceable systems in place to prevent political parties from nominating in miscreant individuals to parliament and then electing them to the highest office in the republic. Until recently, South Africa's Electoral Act, read with the Constitution, was the sole statute governing the conduct of political parties in South Africa, and it devotes a measly 26 words to the, the requirements which political parties must adhere to in order to contest elections. What are those words? And I quote, a party may only contest an election if that party is A, a registered party, and B, has submitted a list of candidates in terms of section 27. That's it, that's the requirement. In every other sense, we are held hostage by the diverse and the arbitrary and inscrutable internal party selection processes which produce presidential candidates like, for example, Zuelim Kizek, former health minister, who is almost certainly guilty of robbing the South African people of the resources to fight a global pandemic which took 101,000 lives, devastated the economy and the health outcomes of millions of people in our country. He doesn't seem to show any shame about the brazenness of this bid for power, and we have to stand by aghast and powerless to stop him from making that bid. Our electoral legal framework plays, just a, places a ridiculous amount of faith in political parties to select individuals of good character, ethics, and purpose to serve in high office without any imp imp obligation being imposed upon them to do so. We have no laws governing the establishment of political parties none setting forth the circumstances under which an individual may or may not avail themselves for party office, and no standards even for the management of party finances unless those finances come from the state. In fact, the Political Party Funding Act of 2018 is our first and only foray into regulating the mechanics of the organizations who we imbue with the power to run for office, win, and then run 1.6 trillion rand in annual government expenditures and revenues. It's time we dealt with this glaring lacuna and passed laws governing the political parties, which our systems gives free reign to to pre-select our government leaders. Think about the checks and balances required of candidates for middle management roles in formal employment. Credit checks, psychometric assessments, police clearance certificates, and the like. How many people occupying seats in Parliament today would lose those seats if they did not pass even one of these requirements were they in existence for political candidates? So, a political party act, which is not unlike the Companies Act, a piece of legislation which governs ownership and control, appointments, financial management, and the reporting of businesses managing private money, would be a very good place to start. A Companies Act prescribes what may, who may or may not serve as a company director. It devotes sections to provisions governing company formation, naming permissions, memorandum of, of incorporation, standards even for record keeping, and is governed by four regulatory agencies. 
Offenses including, include breach of, conf of confidence, false statements, reckless conduct, and hindering administration of the act. Imagine if even some of these provisions apply to the formation and the management of the political parties, which after our elections in South Africa, are free to form governments which have to steward these trillions of rands in public money for the public good. As we better regulate political parties, our maturing democracy must also be animated by checks and balances on their powers in the form of true public participation. President Ramaphosa attempted to wax lyrical about this in his last newsletter, arguing that Parliament has a really strong part public participation system. But for anyone who's worked in that legislature, we know how easy it is for these critical processes where members of the public share their views on pending legislation can be captured by political parties who bus in members to ask sweetheart questions and advance a predetermined agenda. But South Africa is unique amongst democracies around the world, not only for our progressive constitution, but also because we are fundamentally designed to be a participatory democracy. Governance by the people doesn't begin and end at the ballot box. We also have statutory instruments designed to enable our participation in governance in between elections. These range from citizen participation in budget processes through the ward committee system at local level, to CPFs, Community Policing Forums, first introduced in 93 to enable community oversight and support of police services inside their own communities. Active citizenship is not just a buzzword. It's a set of concrete tools and structures which enable voters to do more than just elect voter, uh, leaders to power, but also to walk with them throughout their five years in office to ensure service delivery and accountability. We are fortunate that the statutory frameworks which facilitate true participatory democracy are already baked into our political system. We don't have to draft them from whole cloth. We need only tap into our public imagination to conceive of a society in which we occupy these spaces unapologetically. And we raise the standards of accountability until ours is a government that is truly by the people and for the people. We can reclaim power as citizens we can reclaim it from the vested interests of a system which for too long has been dominated by political parties which are too comfortable with their own dominance. But there are no quick fixes. There are no silver bullets. No single individual leading an institution will sweep in, messiah-like, and save our country. But we're surely grown enough now. We have to save ourselves. Thank you very much.